Hello everyone, Sakuya here, and welcome back to the History of Everything podcast YouTube channel. Are you ready to get into the history of archaeology and conspiracy and all other kinds of wacky stuff? Well, buckle up everyone, because today we're going to be talking about the Baghdad Battery. Now, for anyone who doesn't know exactly what it is that I'm talking about, the idea of the Battery of Baghdad has been something that has intrigued archaeologists for, well, almost a century since it was discovered back in the early 1900s. The question, of course, that people have, based off the name, is, was this thing an actual battery cell, or was it something that was much more simple? Well, let's dive right into it, but first things first, we need to talk about actually what the Baghdad battery is. So first off, rather than say what the Baghdad battery is, it's more accurate to say what the Baghdad battery are, because the Baghdad battery is something that is actually composed of three different components. You see, among the three items, there is a small clay pot, which, when it was found, measured around 14 centimeters in height. Its top, broken off, is believed to have been sealed with asphalt. Inside this was a copper cylinder, which is the second object, which in turn would encase the third thing, an iron rod. That rod would have then protruded through the jar's stopper. Now, any researchers or enthusiasts or anyone who is looking at the Baghdad battery is probably thinking that this is one of the more mysterious artifacts that we've ever actually come across, as the interesting thing to note is that under the right circumstances, this is actually an ancient object that was capable of giving off an electric charge. And mind you, we are talking about something that is 2,000 years old. Therefore, because of that fact, there are many different legends and things that have been crafted around it, such as the Baghdad Battery is a long-lost relic that was gifted to us by aliens and just kind of forgotten there in the desert. Which is rather weird to think, but I'm confident that a number of you who are watching this have probably already seen or heard of videos, whether short-form or long-form content, even here on YouTube, that do things like claim ancient giants or computers or this Baghdad Battery or aliens were all things that existed. Actually, probably side note among this, I probably shouldn't talk about aliens because there's a difference between talking about the possibility of aliens existing and ancient aliens, which that is a whole other thing that we could be doing. But this is not that type of channel, and so we are not going to be pushing any kind of that crap onto you all here today. Instead, no, what we are going to talk about is the genuine history of the Baghdad battery and kind of the mystery that surrounds it. So the other name that the Baghdad battery has is the Wilhelm Koenig battery, this being after the man who was said to have discovered it. A guy who was a painter and an archaeologist, Koenig is someone who would go on to become the director of the National Museum of Iraq. And the thing is, when it came to the Baghdad battery, he provided no details whatsoever of where, when, or how he came across the item. Which is not a great way to start out a video, mind you, that we're just coming at you with no information. Really, it's generally accepted that the Wilhelm Koenig battery was found in what is now the locality of Kujit Rabu, which is in the Iraqi capital of Baghdad, hence the Baghdad battery. But just like the artifact itself, the discovery of the artifact is also something that kind of remains a little bit of a mystery. For example, some of the stories say that Koenig unearthed the battery during an excavation in 1936, whereas other stories say that he actually found it in the basement of the Iraqi Museum in 1938. We don't actually know. What we do know is that Koenig did publish a paper on it, something called a galvanic element from the Parthian period, question mark. And this is where he first puts forward his theory about what the artifact was and what it did. And of course, that actually brings up the question, what would possibly convince Koenig that this was a battery, an ancient Parthian battery? Well, one of the possibilities is that he might have noted that the artifact had two metals with different electropotentials. This, when combined together with an electrolyte, are the main components that are required to make a battery. And in support of this, there is evidence that a kind of ionic solution, an electrolyte, if you will, might have been present in the jar. When they ran tests on the corrosion of the item, this indicated that possibly it once contained something like vinegar or wine. Whatever the case might actually be, it is true that the Baghdad battery, under these circumstances, is something that actually would have been able to produce a degree of electricity, but only around a volt or so. I mean, had there been wires involved, it could have gone up higher, but there is no evidence of any wires in the first place. So that's really all we can go off of. And yes, you've probably heard it already a lot in this video, but I know that I am saying could and possibly and probably a lot in here. 
Really, that is all that I or anyone else should be able to do with this. There is no one that can tell you the definitive answer, because Koenig had no kind of written proof of any kind that supported his theories. To this day, there are quite literally no records whatsoever about the Baghdad battery, or anything that could be described as similar. And so because we have no writings with no information, what then could possibly the Baghdad battery have actually been used for? Several civilizations, as an example, long used forms of electricity in medicine, like how the Greeks would find that placing electric fish on their feet would help in pain relief. Another suggestion that it possibly could have been used as a kind of trickery because they could have embedded the battery into statues of idols so that when someone touched it, it would buzz their followers. It would warm them. It, it would provide a kind of religious magic trick. And for his part, Koenig actually believed that this was something that was used for business. He believed that the battery was something that was used for electric gilding. This being the process by which one would use electricity in order to attach one metal to another, like when you would overlay something with gold or silver. I mean, it is true that such practices were happening at the time in jewelry making and other activities, but of course that is being said with much more primitive methods. He theorized that the battery was developed in order to allow for the much easier process of electroplating. But this doesn't necessarily hold up all that well, because critics of this theory point out, rightfully, that there is literally no evidence of this process at any time or after it. Meanwhile, there's plenty of evidence of other gilding methods, especially mercury residue, from its use in the process. There's just really nothing there that supports it. And I mean, one of the main flaws within Koenig's theory is the actual potency of the battery itself. As I mentioned earlier, the entire thing could produce only around one volt of energy. Such a low power level is not something that could be reasonably used for a lot of things, and when it came to gilding, maybe, possibly, it could do some of it to a degree, but it's certainly not something that would have made things astronomically easier that everyone would have switched over to using. And if they did, then we would probably have found a lot more examples of precisely that. What's more, in order to use this like a battery, you would need to constantly refill the electrolyte which would have simultaneously been incredibly difficult because the entire thing was sealed by a kind of stopper. But really, all that being said, in the end, the final possible death blow to the theory itself is that there really is no evidence. There really is no mention of any kind of device in history that could be like the Baghdad battery, at least in the way that Koenig and others think of it. Surely, if this is something that was that monumentous of an invention, then people would have taken note of it. It would have been described in some way that we would have been able to see today. Yes, of course, you can then say that we possibly lost the records to time, which is always an answer, but simultaneously, there is no physical evidence. There is nothing else. If such an advancement was made, then other people surely would have used it, and we would have more examples than just the one. So, in the end, that brings us to a question of, if this thing is not actually a battery, then what is it? Well, one of the most prominent theories about this is that it was actually just a vessel, something that would act as storage for sacred scrolls. I mean, not only are they visually similar to other examples of such containers that were at nearby sites such as at Tigris, but it was also found in a place that contained many such jars. And so according to this hypothesis, the iron rod would have had the scroll wrapped around it, which was then placed inside of the copper tube, and Koenig even cited such scroll jars in his paper as being very common at the digs themselves. Which then makes me wonder, why is it that he would think that in the first place it was a battery and not just one of those scroll jars? It just strikes the entire thing as being kind of odd. But that is not the fun idea. And really, the idea of an ancient battery is a very intriguing one. The thing is, as many people have pointed out, just because something could have been used as a battery does not mean that it actually was used as one. Really, the entire thing was far more likely to have been used as a kind of scroll storage. But everyone, that is the story of the Baghdad Battery, one of the great mysteries of the internet that conspiracy theorists really love to bring up and you see all kinds of little viral stupid videos on TikTok and other platforms about. I hope that you all enjoyed today's episode. Please make sure to like, comment, subscribe, do anything you can to support this video in the algorithm. I appreciate all of you for watching. Thank you very much for joining me here today. Again, let me know in the comment section below what it is that we should do next, whatever questions you have, and we'll go ahead and tackle those. Thank you, everyone, and I wish you the best of luck. Goodbye, guys.